The following podcast is a Sempronto Media production. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode, and I have a very special guest. It's Sandra Scheinbaum, and she is amazing. I just love her to death, and she is passionate about training people how to be health coaches and how to help us lead healthier lives. And today, our title is How to Stop Being a Sugar Addict and Get Freedom from Sugar for Life. So welcome, Sandra. Tell listeners a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Well, it's an honor to be here. And uh, where I am now isn't where I began. So I was set out to be a school teacher and first in elementary education. And then because I didn't do so well in in my my, uh, practicum and student teaching and couldn't control a classroom that well. So, okay, I'll get a master's degree and did that in learning disabilities, working with kids with special needs. And of course, wound up in a classroom with kids with severe behavior disorders. So I uh, was able to uh, learn uh, ways of managing behavior management and went on to teach at colleges, how, taught for many years how to teach people to be great special ed teachers, and then got a doctorate in clinical psychology. And then for about 35 years, that was what I did. And I was a renegade as a psychologist. So I was doing mind-body medicine before anybody knew about that. I was teaching breathing in the late 70s, and uh, it was before it was called breath work. Um, But that was a way to help people quiet themselves. And I also then specialized in positive psychology, because I always knew that it's, it's really more about what's right with you than what's wrong with you. And founded Functional Medicine Coaching Academy when I was 65, when all my friends were retiring. Uh, I had had a very successful practice. It was local as a psychologist because I was known as the mind body medicine, that biofeedback lady. I helped a lot of kids with ADD and people with anxiety and panic, wrote books about panic attacks. Um, but what really um, was uh, pervasive in my early 20s and 30s was the fact that I was a sugar addict big, big time and was getting really severe panic attacks. And I didn't realize that so many things were tied in, gut health and panic, and it was all traced to the poor diet that I had. I wasn't exercising. And so I learned functional medicine. I went to the Institute for Functional Medicine, trained there and got certified. I was actually the only psychologist to get that certification. And that's what inspired me to put all of the things that I had learned for so many years. I've worked with patients and saw they were getting better and I had gotten better by this integration. And I've always been a big proponent of it's not one philosophy or one strategy, but it's integrating and it's changing how you think and how you breathe and how you carry yourself, your posture and how you feel, changing your emotional state. And then looking at what you're eating and how you're moving and your relationships and your meaning and purpose. So it sounds like a lot, but you put it all together and it's magic. Awesome. Well, I'm so excited because I I have a continuous blood glucose monitor that I just got and I'm obsessed with it. I don't I don't have pre-diabetes and I don't have diabetes. I just love to see what my blood sugar is at all times. And I don't want to sit there and prick myself. And it's just been amazing for me to watch that I honestly don't process sugar very well. Like my, my blood sugar really goes up when I have too many carbs and too many sugars. And I love to see that on here. So I'm fasting right now. Look at, it's funny because it just switched. Like it was at 80 And now it just went down to 75. So it's just constantly going and it's constantly changing. But um, talk about your experience with a blood glucose, continuous blood glucose monitor. And how did that help you in any way of getting on your journey of cutting out sugar? Well, this is eye-opening. So I've worn this a few times and it, it's really insight. Um, in many ways, um, it's just like what I did when I'm my early part of my career. It's biofeedback. Biofeedback means you get feedback information back about your body. So 
I was doing it where I would have people wear breathing belts and they'd say, oh, I'm breathing from my chest, not my stomach. Well, here you have insight into your blood sugar. And the cool thing is you don't have to prick your finger. You don't have to go to the doctor and get a lab test because when you get a fasting blood sugar just one time, well, that's one second of your your day and you don't want to say, well, I'm going to extrapolate from there to, well, this is the way it is. It's constant all the time. So when you wear a monitor, it's fluctuating constantly. So what I would notice was very, very surprising. So some things, like if I would eat some fruit, well, that didn't cause a spike, but stress Boy, did that ever. So I can share one experience. So um, my daughter had written um, an off-Broadway musical and it was opening night and she was performing in it. And she's been a child actress from way back. So I've I've been a stage mom and there's always that tension. It's like opening night, the critics are there. So lots of pressure. And I was wearing my glucose monitor and realized, whoa, this is higher than it's ever been. Uh, And so stress can play a huge role. So if you have one, it's not just the sugar, but of course, sugar can, uh, like Chantal, I am also one that I cannot process sugar. And I wish I had this back in the day because my addiction started when I went to college and I would just eat bags of cookies. I remember going to Baskin Robbins and getting an ice cream cone and well, that wasn't enough. I had to have another one or in the dorm going back for a second serving of cake and I was still not satisfied. So then I'd get a bag of uh, M&Ms and polish off that. I was truly addicted to sugar and this went on for many, many years. Um, When I was in my 20s, I was a teacher and uh, those were the days when, you know, you had the parents were allowed to bring snacks. Uh, Parent moms would drop off the Oreo cookies and I had this cupboard filled with all this this great stuff. Um, um, Not great at the time, what I know now, but it was addictive. And I just remember um, when the kids would go out for recess, like just you know, eating half a package of Oreos. Those moms had to be bringing in, oh, these treats are going fast. What's going on here? Um, So sugar is so addictive. Wow. So let's talk about the typical day of what that looks like for you, of what does, you know, just an average day look like for you and your eating? Yeah, so let me compare and contrast. So back then, um, a breakfast might be grabbing a bagel, or I thought I was being healthy where I would have a few carrots. We didn't know back then. This is the 70s. And so and when I went to college, it was the 60s. So I would just binge on uh, junk foods, all sugar. And then, oh, I've got to lose five pounds to fit in that dress because I have a party over the weekend. So then I'll go on some crazy diet, like I'll just eat carrots and celery all day. Um, And this, you know, this was this yo-yo pattern where you'd gain five pounds, you'd lose five pounds. And what do I, and so my day was basically all carbs. I thought that uh, eating carrots or other vegetables and, and vegetables have carbs too. So that was it. And compared to now, now what I do is I intermittent fast. So I I haven't been eating today yet. It's early where I am. And so then um, around noon or one, I will have something like some eggs and avocado. And um, I noticed that even having a smoothie, a smoothie uh, or a green juice, that can be deceptively high in sugar. If you're even putting in, you know, a lot of the powders, there's five grams of sugar here and two grams there. And you can end up having more sugar than your body can tolerate. When I had the glucose monitor, that's what I was noticing. So I will typically have more and more protein. Uh, I was a crazy vegan and uh, uh, during the 80s and 90s. So uh, if you were to go into my kitchen, you would see every cookbook, every dieting trend is there. I could like categorize them. Here was the crazy raw vegan and the macrobiotic days. And so uh, that was uh, I don't do anything like that anymore. Now I really focus on I, for my age, eat a lot of protein. So I always think protein first, a lot of red meat, a lot of um, things that are high in omega-3s, um, a lot of fats. 
and healthy fat. So I do tons of avocado. And I notice that when I have those foods, I'm satiated. So if I have eggs and avocado and maybe, you know, a few vegetables as well for lunch, then I'm not that hungry. I don't have cravings. And I've also gone away from the snack mentality because I was also in that era where, you know, it's three square meals and then every two hours a snack and oh, God forbid you should leave the house and you don't have food and you, know, you might get hungry and you might need a snack. Uh, and what I noticed that fasting has become easier and easier. So I have started, I do intermittent fasting about uh, having uh, an eight hour, usually, usually it's a six hour eating window and sometimes a little more, sometimes less. Um, but like once a week, I will do a longer fast and like 23 hours of um, 24 hours sometimes. So um, we just had a fast um, for Yom Kippur, Jewish holiday. And uh, I remember years ago struggling, like I could not make it through the day. I was weak. I was like just miserable. And now um, it was nothing like, oh, you know, no big deal. And I was actually looking forward to it. Whereas, um, you know, other people like, oh, I hope you have an easy fast and that they were dreading it and it's misery. And I think, oh, this is, this is a piece of cake. Yeah. It's funny. Cause I, I actually, my, I'm looking at my blood sugar now it's at 72, but, um, I'm actually fasting right now. I did it. I haven't eaten since Sunday. So I'm probably at about a 40, five hour fast. And it's just been so easy for me. So um, if you guys want to check out some easy tips of what I do to fast, let's, let's talk about that with you. What are some things for you that make it a really easy fast? Like what makes it easier on you? Sure. So uh, I always like to have things that I've planned to do, usually work projects. I need something that can be focused for my attention. And then I'll feel like the hours go by. Um, I also make sure I drink a lot of water. Um, so for Yom Kippur and the Jewish holiday, you're, technically, you're really not supposed to drink water, but um, I cheat a little bit. I think that's crucial to not get dehydrated. Uh, and also to take it easy. So I do a lot of exercise in my day. And when I'm fasting, I will cut back. So I'll do some yoga poses and uh, some things that are less strenuous, some Pilates. I have a Pilates reformer and love to do that. But uh, on days when I'm not eating, I take it easier. Uh, I don't do some real strenuous workouts uh, and that's helped. But anything that can distract you can be um, really good. And then using um, some mindfulness or uh, if you want to call it meditation techniques, but definitely breathing and focus on where you've come, not how much farther you have to go. Like, whoa, I've already not eaten for 12 hours, for 16, for 23. This is a piece of cake. And so you celebrate uh, as you go through this, as opposed to, oh, I've got, I'm not going to make it and not giving in to those kinds of thoughts, because that's really what can do you in more than anything else. Yeah. I would say for me, um, one of the things I've added into my fasting that's really helped is I actually take iodized sea salt. So I'm low in iodine. If you have thyroid issues, some people a lot of times are, are low in iodine. I just took my blood work last time and it said that I was low in iodine. So I take some iodized sea salt and just put it on my hand and kind of lick it to make sure I'm having those electrolytes. And then I'll take, sometimes I'll have a, like a teaspoon if I really need it. I haven't used it this time, but I'll take a teaspoon of pickle juice and that will really help sometimes get through. But I will say walking is the great elixir. And you think, oh, you're fasting, you're weak. When I walk, it's like, because I, I could be like, oh, I'm dying. I need something to eat, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I will 
just feel so much better. So walking for me is really big. And also for me is the time of the month for, for my period. Um, so I always make sure if I'm doing a longer fast, I try to do it between day 15 to day 21 and day 15 to day 21 is the easiest time for me to fast. So if I'm going to do an extended fast, three days, seven days, something like that, I always make sure it's in that window because for me, whatever, because of my hormones, that is the easiest time for me to fast. Like right now I'm fasting. It's been just cakewalk easy. So, which it's not always that easy for me. That is a great insight. And uh, I also um, have been walking as well. The other thing that I love to do, so when I fast on Sunday, I take a morning ballet class over Zoom and just the movement, it's very slow and it's to music. I've always loved ballet. And so something like that really um, helps me to get through it. I also want to point out now I am well, well past menopause. And I also, I found great success with the fasting mimicking diet um, because of my weight. Um, my, um, my BMI is lower than what they recommend for an extended fast. Now, you know, we're talking about 20 hours, 24 hours. This is fine. But if I were to go much longer, um, I would, <laughs> wasting away is literally what I would do when I'm getting into, <laughs> like, I'm, I am I only weigh um, like 86 pounds. So, um, right. you know, even though I'm all muscle, um, but um, in terms of just the body weight. Um, so, so I found great success with a fasting mimicking diet, um, which is supposed to mimic the effects of a five day water only fast, um, which is right for some people and not for others. So I think the key here is that it's not one size fits all. It is personalized. It's based on um, who you are and what your body needs and how you will thrive. So let's talk about what the day in the life of you looks like even more. So we talked about that. I love that you you said you do about a six hour window. I love that you say you don't snack. And again, this is what I, I've been saying this, like on every episode, I'm like, eat in a six hour window, <laughs> only eat two meals. One of the, I, this is what I, I always tell people, I say, I make it real simple. You eat two meals a day. One is an actual meal. One is more like a tasting. It's not a huge meal. You don't snack in between. You eat in a six hour window. Um, and so it's, I love it that here's somebody. And then you really watch that sugar content. Because for me, as soon as I start adding in that sugar, um, too much sugar, too much carbs, and I'm, you know, like hungry, hungry hippo. So um, talk about talk about that. So you said at around 12 or one o'clock each day, you're going to have eggs, you have avocado, how much eggs, how much avocado kind of dive into that? Yeah. So, uh, my past life would have been one egg or my past life would have been just something carb. So, you know, I was used to be a vegan. So I thought, I mean, I raised my kids that way. And so it would be like, like a piece of bread and no cheese and nothing else. It was like, I remember we'd have pizza, we'd pull off the cheese because of the, like, no, no fat. You can't have, you know, anything like that. So it's exact opposite now. So I would have had one egg. Well, now I might have two or even three because I'm trying to really, um, you know, I'm 70 and it's very crucial to have protein. So gauge that. And sometimes we fear protein um, because, and we fear fat. So I will have egg, then I switch it off. I have an instant pot, which I love. So I always, it's like five minutes to make hard boiled eggs. So I'll always have those available. And then I might have a combination. I make my own beef jerky. I get some flank steak, or sometimes it's even already sliced as a stir fry and super easy marinade and um, no sugar. And then I have a dehydrator. So I always have like some, some stuff like that out and I'll add it to, to the egg, or I might have some leftover like hamburger or whatever I have from the night before. And I'll just have a little bit of that too. Cause I find like, I really need meat. Um, and um, so, cause I don't get anemic. I had um, dealt with that years ago. So there's that. And then I will have an avocado and I'll put some, 
some olive oil, something else on it, MCT oil on that. And then my greens have changed too. So um, I was one of those raw kale people, like, and I would have a smoothie, like, you know, with pounds of kale or chard and realize like, ooh, you're like, maybe that's was too much. And so I've cut back on that. And now I, I grow my own sprouts and microgreens are super easy. There's a company called Hamama. I love, I'm obsessed with it. So I'll have some greens, I'll some What's cucumber. What's the name of that? Say that Hamama, H-A-M-A-M-A. And it's super easy. Um, you just it's you just put water in a tray, and they have this. Um, uh, it, it's like you you don't need soil. You just plop this whatever they have in this package. That's um, it looks like a, a mat. <laughs> it looks like a, a carpet thing, the fiber, and you just put it in this tray. And five days later, it's, you you unpeel it, and then it grows. And in ten days, you have these gorgeous microgreens. So I've been doing a lot of that, uh, broccoli microgreens. And I'll just spread that on my eggs or whatever else I've had. And, and sometimes I'll switch off. I'll have a green smoothie, but I'll make it with, um, I'll use, I just throw in um, collagen protein and I'll also use an avocado because I like it thick. And, and then I will have a tiny, like I'll do my sugar. Uh, my fruit is like half a cup of blueberries or strawberries and I freeze them too. So sometimes I'll just take them out of the freezer and, um, and that's it. And uh, I, I love a hundred percent dark chocolate. So I still, I feel like that's my, my, um, uh, I love chocolate. It's great for you, but it's also, I can think of it like a dessert. So I have not had real sugar for so long that even a hundred percent dark chocolate tastes sweet. Whereas some people who are not there like, oh, oh this is disgusting. My daughter t- tried it and she's like, oh, mom, that's like, this is awful. How can you eat this? But when you're gone from sugar for a while, things that you would think are even bitter start to acquire this sweet taste. I'll put the hama.com so people it's like hamama. Yeah. <laughs> mama. Hamama. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'll put that in the show notes. That's really cool. I love microgreens. I think they make everything taste better. Yes, but let's absolutely. talk about some hidden sugars and foods because a lot of people think they're not having sugar, but let's talk about the surprising sources of hidden sugar and where you see people are kind of in denial of how much sugar they're eating. Oh yeah, it really sneaks up on you. So my husband's a perfect example. So he always tells people, oh, I don't eat desserts. I don't have a sweet tooth. I don't have a problem. So, um, and we have separate sections in our house. So, like there's his food and there's mine. And the things that he likes, for example, ketchup. He cannot eat a hamburger without just like smothering it in ketchup. Well, there's sugar in ketchup. You can now find there's some companies like Primal Kitchen will make one without sugar, but um, in terms of the added sugar, it's in most prepared sauces. It's in things that, again, you don't associate, like even balsamic vinegar is a source of sugar. There are also a lot of the the protein powders and certainly the the, um, energy bars and the health bars that are basically candy bar. So you look at how much sugar is in there uh, and it adds up where you think, okay, well, this one has only four grams. But if you add that to the two grams here and the six grams there and 10 grams and something else, then, you know, it, it adds up. And then you can be in trouble if you have difficulty uh, processing, you know, like we were talking about. And most people do if because it's just it's if you look in every processed food. I did a talk many years ago and I had gone to the grocery store to prepare and I just took pictures of labels of all of these foods and yogurt. There's more yogurt. There's like 34 grams of sugar in a fat-free, healthy, good for you yogurt. So when I look at food labels, that's the first thing my eye goes to. I don't care about fat, calories, forget it. That doesn't matter. But I look at the grams of sugar and also the, the carbohydrates. So if it's got a lot of fiber, then might offset. But I totally, that's like the first thing 
huge grams of sugar. Yeah, I think the with the yogurt, like you said, I mean, I've happened, my husband wanted me to buy some yogurt for him and I was looking at them. I could not believe, cause he was like, I want, I'm craving peach yogurt. So I was like, okay, I was looking at them all. And like you said, I couldn't believe how much they were, the, the lowest ones was like 17 to 33 grams yeah. per, for an eight ounce serving, yeah. you know? And then that's, that's as about as much as two scoops of ice cream. Like you could, oh. that, that is a, the amount of sugar that's in one of those yogurts is about as much as two scoops of chocolate ice cream. Totally. How about this? A pumpkin latte Starbucks is 50 grams of sugar. Yes. <laughs> my husband, there's a, he loves this one caramel drink from Starbucks. And now if you look on the app, it tells you how much sugar is in it. The drink that I bought him the other day was 44 grams of sugar. And I was like, this has 44 grams mm-hmm. of sugar. How could you possibly drink this? Uh, um, instant oatmeal, you know, oatmeal has a good reputation of being full of healthy fiber, but some of those you know, instant fruit flavored instant ones, they have 15 grams of sugar per packet. Yep. I know it's insane. So sugar and uh, is in basically all processed foods. You have to really accept that. And so even um, like bacon, there's some that's um, they there's sugar added, and uh, there's some debate about you know like if you're making your own yogurt and you it's okay to put a little bit of like maple syrup in that. And um, but really, and and I also want to point out that we're not just talking about like cane sugar. And there's so many ways that sugar is hiding because it's different word. So there's, there's like 20 different words that can describe. Um, so it's corn syrup and brown rice syrup. And uh, when my kids were little and I would bake, and those were the days where it was like brown rice syrup was in was everything. And so I thought, oh, we're being so healthy because I'm baking this with brown rice syrup or agave. I went through a period before we found out how bad agave was, um, which is big in the health food community. Um, But that's pure sugar, maple syrup, or um, so there's just, you know, maltodextrin and anything that has dextrin in it. So all those chemicals are, again, another way of saying this is sugar. Hey guys, one of the things that will take your weight loss to the next level is coaching. You can either work one-on-one with me or one of our certified private coaches. If you'd like, you can schedule your free call. It's a 10-minute strategy call just to see if coaching is going to really take you to the next level. Don't just take my word for it. Listen to this recent review a happy coaching client sent in. Thanks so much for your help and guidance. I never could have done it without you. The other thing is listening to the audiobook. Listening to the audiobook and getting the video course that I've done, people are seeing dramatic results. If you just listen to the audiobook 30 minutes a day, over and over and over again, and get the video course, go to ChantelRayway.com and check out the video course. You won't be sorry you did. Yeah, you know, I was looking, you know, coleslaw. You know, sometimes like if you, let's say you went to a fast food restaurant and like you had to order something. So I was looking at the coleslaw, which is quote, considered a healthy side dish at a fast food restaurant. The, I looked at the sugar content in one of a regular side coleslaw from a popular fast food place. It had 15 grams of sugar. For yeah. It. Yeah. Again, you could eat a candy bar and you probably <laughs> have less sugar. So. Yeah. And so, salad dressings is another big one because you think yes. you're eating so well. And then you look at these salad dressings and now the dressing is having, you know, anywhere from seven to 14 grams of sugar. Yeah. And it could be, uh, they're putting corn syrup and, uh, and also juices. That's another one that is huge. So it might be, or even if it's, you know, it says organic and it's healthy. And, and so anything that has a food label as healthy or fat free or even keto now we're seeing you know any new diet trend what follows is the desserts so um, I was looking at um, now like there's companies that are making keto brownies and uh, keto uh, muffins and well there's still sources of 
uh, sweetener in it. And now a lot of times they're using the sugar alcohols, but too much of that um, because it can really stimulate something. And, and I found that personally when I was eating too many of the xylitol and all of malitol and all of the all <laughs> alcohols that are in some foods that to sweeten, to give that sweet taste. So they may not raise your, they apparently are not supposed to raise your blood sugar. But in my case, when I wore my continuous glucose monitor, they sure did. So a lot of those so-called health bars that they'll say no sugar and they're sugar alcohols, but I still had a reaction and it was setting off a craving like I want more. I can't just eat one of them. Right. Um, so let's talk about ways so you can kind of, cause once you get it out of your system, so let's talk about the transition. Cause let's say somebody is really looking to get high in sugar. They're like, you know, they, their diet is very high in carbs. They have, they have a big sweet tooth. Cause I think, I truly believe there are two types of people. Like if you said, you know, to me, would you rather have a cookie or would you rather have chips? I would always pick the cookie. I am a sweets person. And there's a lot of people who are like, you know, I, I'd rather have the chips. I'd rather have the crunchy. So, and I'm assuming before you were the type that would say, yes, I want the cookie, right? Oh, big time. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to kind of walk, I need you to walk us through because would you say to someone, okay, look, the best thing for you is just to go cold turkey and just say, look, I'm not going to have sugar. What's that transition look like for someone? Yeah. So I think there's a lot of factors. So think about how you've changed in other areas of your life. So if you, how do you build a habit and break an old one? And it, there's a lot of research that it's in tiny steps. And so you focus on your, where do you want to start? Now, for some people, they're going to do it by start by getting it out. So you, you prompts are very, very significant. So if you have a cupboard or pantry that's full of all the stuff, you can do a cleanse. And it, um, when I used to work, um, I'm no longer working as a psychologist, but when I did and people were interested in this and they take like a big bag and you take all that food, like you start reading labels, oh, this goes, that goes, and you uh, do that and you get it out. Now, it might be complicated because you may not live by yourself or you may not have everybody that you're living with on board. And so, you know, you can't throw away your son's favorite cereal or, you know, even though it might be tempting you. So you might not be able to do that. Um, so the first thing is you, you make that decision based on what you have overcome earlier. Do you like doing it gradually, like starting an exercise program? Well, you may not start out by, you know, I'm going to run six miles. Well, I'm going to start where I can. So possibly you start by shifting to a, a lower sugar version, for example. So that might be that you would, instead of having something that is, um, you might start with, well, I still like the taste of like berries. Um, or so I'm going to shift from having a high sugar like grapes, which are higher in sugar. So I'm going to shift there. And so that could have an impact. And then you look at, well, OK, then a salad dressing. Well, here's one that has you read that label and maybe it has like 12 grams of sugar. I'm going to buy the one that has six grams of sugar. So you start to lower it item by item. And there might be some of those items where you say, hey, do I really need this? And I'm going to try the, the no sugar version, like the no sugar ketchup, which you can get from companies like Primal Kitchen. Usually anything that's advertised like as keto will be a, a good choice um, or even a paleo um, in terms of the name of the product. So you look there, but you're always reading that label and see gradually I can decrease it. But another great way to start, I think, is some of these eating habits. So it's not just what you eat, as we know, and we've been talking about. So you may look at eliminating the snacks. Can I um, just go from meal to meal? Because 
that I could not do that years ago. Um, so where I'm sitting right now, if I if this computer, I would have been having a bowl of something. And even if it was nuts um, or something like beside years ago, it was M&Ms. But um, I could not write a paper um, without eating at the same time, eating in my car. So um, those are things that I worked really hard to disassociate, to not pair every time I sit down at the computer to do some work that's kind of hard and I don't want to do, oh, I'll sweeten it by literally having something sweet. So it's really sticking to, to where you're eating and then look at why you're eating. Um, and for me, it was a lot of mindless eating. It was a lot of um, doing things that are multitasking. And I don't realize like, oh, I just, you know, ate that whole box, box or that bag or something. So you can start there. You can start by shifting and setting an intention. And for habit change, you start really small. So you don't set yourself up to fail. So you don't say forever, I'm going to give up snacking. Can I, I'm going to do this between 12 and six tonight. That's it. You set it up that like, or, or even if you, you can even set it smaller between 12 and one, I'm not going to have any snacks. So that's how you change. And then the key, this comes from my friend, BJ Fogg at Stanford, who wrote Tiny Habits. It is like, yay, I did it. That celebratory ending is so important because we're hard on ourselves and we're focused on, oh, I failed. I couldn't do it. And I'm a loser. But you really want to focus on, yay, I did it. And you break it down so small. Like even if you decide, OK, I'm going to shift to a different brand of salad dressing or I'm going to make my own, which is super simple. Um, and then you, yes, I did it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, things like, you know, one of the things I noticed that I looked at one of Kyle's snacks that he was had, and he loves like those mandarin oranges and like fresh juice. But I think it, he had one that someone brought in and it had light syrup and it had 39 grams of sugar in a one cup serving for mandarin oranges. And so it's like, okay, well, if he really is craving oranges, like instead pick a different choice, just have fresh fruit. Like here's a mandarin orange. You can have that instead. I've also seen people have energy drinks and they have a lot of sugar along with the caffeine. So they could have the energy drinks could have 25 grams per eight ounce serving. You know, it's like, instead just have black coffee, you know, with MCT oil, which is, or, you know, add coconut oil, which will bring your blood sugar down when you have that. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. And finding ways to make that yourself. So um, I was making my own almond milk and coconut milk. So you buy those and it's, oh yeah, these are healthy and it's better than having the dairy. But then you look on the labels, a lot of those have a lot of sugar as well. So you can make it yourself. Um, I've just got, I haven't arrived. It hasn't come yet. I'm so excited, but it is called the almond. Uh, it's a cow, almond cow, and it makes almond milk and not other kinds of nut milks. I'm really, really excited about that. So it's becoming easier to do things like that, to make it yourself. Yeah. And things that like, for example, pasta sauce, you know, they taste savory, like they don't taste sweet, but a lot of those pasta sauces have anywhere from, you know, eight to 12 grams of sugar for a half a cup of serving. And that's what you'd get in like a small double chocolate chip cookie, you know? Yes. Yes. So you can make your own or you find versions. Unfortunately, there are more and more companies making these without added sugar. So when you're craving sugar, I, I wonder, are you, are you at the point now you, because you've been sugar free for so long, do you ever crave sugar? Oh, yes. But I don't crave like the Oreos or the ice cream that I used to crave. What I crave are things like cashews. And cashews, that's a nut that can sneak up on you. Okay, there's a lot more sugar in cashews than other like a macadamia nut, for example. So I try and go to other versions because I know for me, if I have a bag of raw cashews, forget it. Like I'll eat way too much. So a treat for me, um, and I either buy cashew butter or make my own occasionally, I will just have like 
that's my dessert. I'll have a little, like a teaspoon of it. And then I put coconut shred, shredded coconut on it with a little cacao nibs. I'm obsessed with cacao nibs. There are no sugar. It's just the raw chocolate and it's, it's, they're crunchy. And so I will just mix that up and that, that feels good. And it has, cause I used to love ice cream so much that this is um, something that satisfies the craving. The other thing that I will do is make, there's popsicles and I'll create a version. I'll just take avocados, put it in a blender and a food processor with some cacao powder and maybe some coconut milk and just put it, I got these stainless steel um, popsicle molds and I'll put it in the freezer. And it's just that sensation of having something cold. Sometimes I'll put a a dash of like a mint um, essential oil, just a like a fraction of a drop and it creates that chocolate minty taste uh, even though there's zero sugar it's just an avocado and some um, cacao powder Mm. so out of all the nuts so almonds cashews hazelnuts macadamians pine nuts pistachio walnuts which one of those has the lowest sugar I think Brazil nuts are pretty low, right? Yeah, yeah. Brazil nuts are good. Brazil nuts, walnuts, they're all good. Um, the cashews are our highest. So that's, um, so if you look on the labels, like for nut butter, pistachios are higher. higher. Yes, pistachios, yes, absolutely. And that's why I love pistachios. Um, mm-hmm. So you have to be careful with, with those because I think for me, nuts became addictive. They became my new sugar, my new dessert. And so I have to, And even you know now I have to be careful about nuts because I can eat way too many, and they're they were a snacking food for me. So um, I would go to the kitchen and a handful of nuts, and then two hours later go and take another handful of nuts, and whoa, I've been eating a whole lot of nuts today. Hey guys, I wanted to tell you I'm offering a free weight loss virtual Bible study. Now is the perfect time to focus on understanding true hunger and fullness and learn what the Bible has to say about it. All you have to do is go to ChantelRayWay.com slash Bible study. After you sign up, you'll receive a six week Bible study video that you can watch on your own or you can get a small group of people and do it together. That's ChantelRayWay.com slash Bible study for your free six week Bible study course. So one of the things that I liked what you said, I'm for me, I'm a fruit junkie. I love fruit. And so like, especially blueberries, I love blueberries, but I can get like the other day, I just, someone brought in this fresh whipping cream and blueberries for me as a treat. And I literally in one sitting had two, um, probably a cup and a half of blueberries in one sitting. And I was like, oh my gosh, like just went a little crazy, but you know, one cup of blueberries has about 14 to 15 grams of sugar. So if you said 14 grams of sugar, I like that you said, you know, I'll have half of a cup of blueberries, which that would be about seven grams of sugar is, is, do you have like a special number where you say, you know, I try to keep everything under 10 grams or under seven grams, or do you kind of have like a number where you say, this is when I know that I have this, you know, more than this amount of sugar, then here, my blood sugar is going to spike. Now I'm just going to want more sugar, beget sugar, beget sugar. Yeah, so I used to be obsessed with numbers. And I, you know, came of age in the days when calories was everything. And I obsessively you know, took charted and wrote down every, uh, every calorie. And, uh, and so I have moved away from that. And I now I'm just not one to really measure I eyeball it. And so I can tell I have these little bowls that I got at Crate and Barrel, these little tiny, they're really cute. And okay, this is like my dessert bowl and I know they're about a half a cup so I'll just fill it up with with some berries so I don't measure and know that when I go above that um, and it's usually it's not just like the the berries but if I were to because I have in the past and still to this day like it's that binge eating it's very easy to slip into that uh, and especially with one meal a day so oh, this is my I gotta pack everything in I gotta get enough food and because I'm not gonna be eating again for a period of time and so um, I was tending and noticed that well I was eating so so much. So I would, would have a, a, a meal, like an entree, what we would say is an entree, 
vegetables. And, and then, okay, what am I going to have now? And then I'll uh, fill it up a little bowl of, of nuts. And now I got to have my fruit. And then, oh, wait, I have, I'll have something else um, to go with it. And so it just built up. And that's when I feel, I feel it physically. I'll start to feel like, kind of like spacey. And then when I had the blood glucose monitor realized like, no, that was a whopping amount because even too much food at one sitting, like a Thanksgiving meal, um, can you, you know how you feel after that? And so for me, it's like really being attuned to my body and knowing what it feels like. It's almost like a sugar rush that I get. And even too many berries, like you're saying, can do that. And so I just um, know that's like, okay, I'm just going to have a handful. And sometimes I alternate. So I realize that I probably feel my best. I have the most energy when I have no fruit. I remember I was at a conference a number of years ago and I just decided for the time of this conference, I'm going to have nothing because I was non, they didn't have organic fruit and I wasn't going to have those high, you know, the high um, pesticide laden grapes or berries. And so it was none of that. And I felt fantastic. And so often I realize, and then I, I waver like, oh, you know, for brain health, there's so many studies that um, berries, blueberries particularly are so good for cognitive ability and preserving your memory. So I do have a little bit of that, but that's one of the reasons that I can't go higher because I saw on my blood monitor, it went higher when I had them. That's awesome. Yeah. I really highly suggest if you, I'll put some information in the show notes of how to get a continuous blood glucose monitor, because you can't, it's not an as easy of a trick because believe it or not, um, number one, you have to pay for it. So because my doctor couldn't prescribe this to me, you know, it cost me about $500 because my insurance won't pay for it because they know that my blood glucose numbers are fine from all the fasting that I did. And I will say this before I started intermittent fasting, I say this all the time. I would wake up in the morning and my blood sugar was always in the pre-diabetic range. So when I would wake up, I was anywhere from a hundred to 105, uh, on my, my fasting blood glucose levels when I was, before I started doing intermittent fasting. Now that I started doing intermittent fasting, my blood glucose levels are a lot lower. They're anywhere from, you know, 80 to 90, which are really good. So I feel like, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, well, I'm, I can't do intermittent fasting because, you know, my blood glucose numbers aren't great. And I'm like, that's what's going to help you. <laughs> Intermittent fasting is what's going to help your blood glucose levels. It's not going to make them worse. Any other tips for someone that is doing this transition? So like, let's say they're like, you know, even with the blueberries, like me the other day, like I, I went and had probably a half a cup of blueberries. And then I was like, well, I want another cup. And I went and grabbed it. Any tips to get yourself out of when you're wanting to have more of that sugar than, than pot, than you need. Yeah. So first is to recognize that sugar is more addictive than cocaine and even in blueberries. So know that it has this strong power over you and it is a serious addiction. Number two that you want to celebrate your wins and not feel guilty because that'll do you in. It'll result in wanting more sugar because you'll get stressed if you're berating yourself. So you want to be kind to yourself and then focus on really setting an intention, like taking even a moment to be aware. OK, like how much have you already eaten? And a lot of times people get into this like, well, I've already eaten it. So what I'll finish, you know, I'll finish this. So you want to focus on where did that come from? Well, maybe it was from you were little and, you know, you were told to clean your plate and eat everything and notice that you can always stop. So it, even if you have like midway, I have stopped like in halfway through, like about to take a bite. I'm like, wait a minute. Do I really need this? And then I didn't even like spit it out. <laughs> I remember I was eating these. I got I was at a conference and got these free uh, bars. These uh, from a, a nutrition company and realized, what am I doing? Like I don't want this. I'm gonna. It's just gonna make me sick. 
And so I actually spit it out. So wherever you are in this process, to focus on celebrating that you what you have done instead of focusing on the day that you didn't do that so well, because that will help you to go forward and look at why are you doing this? Like, what brings you joy? What do you want this health for? So I was a pre-diabetic. I was there and I had those sky high numbers. And like Chantal, when I started intermittent fasting, it changed dramatically. And that's, I think that was the key to your taste buds changing. It's that fasting period. Let's talk a little bit about if you, if someone says, what about like, for birthdays or holidays? Cause I know I just had a guest on not too long ago and she's like, you know, she's like, even for my birthday or even for a big holiday, I'm not having cake. She's like, I've just made the decision. I'm just not going there. I can have fruit or I can have a, something else. So what is your experience with that? What would you say to someone if they're like, well, gosh, are you really saying like for my birthday or for a special occasion not to have it? What's your opinion on that? Yes, that's what I have to do. That's what works for me because I have to admit I'm a sugar addict and one taste will set off this downward spiral. So uh, the last time I entertained, which was uh, New Year's Day um, because of our, our circumstances and how we're living, but I had a big party and open house. And so I was baking for days. Now, uh, these were people who were new to the way I eat. So there was nothing there that we would consider like unhealthy. I didn't use sugar. I didn't even use, there was one that I used a bit of maple syrup, but everything was monk fruit sweetened. And so I basically had given myself permission to eat. Some of them were like recipes that um, I had uh, made over the years, but I made them in different ways. But so basically I had this whole sweet table out with brownies and lemon tarts and um, all, all these different types of cakes. And so it was course when people left that my in the olden days and I'd still have that habit to some extent where it's like okay now the company's left I can put on my sweats and whoa as I'm putting away all this food um I was eating oh this cookie yeah this is really good and oh here's a fudge uh, you know ball and whoa that's great um and so some of uh, it was giving in and it, it happened so quickly because then the next day I was still, it was like talking to me. Even I had put it in uh, all into the freezer, a lot of this stuff. And it's like, cause I thought, oh, the kids will come over. I don't want to just throw it away or um, so. Okay, I'll take one. And then an hour later, I'm craving another one. So the big takeaway is once you give into that, that little piece of chocolate cake on your birthday, yeah, you may say, well, I can only have that little taste, but perhaps two hours later or the next day, you're going to still be thinking about it because that's the power of sugar or even the sweet taste. And so what I do when it's my birthday is I celebrate with, well, I'm going to, you know, the cashew, I'll have a little bit more of those because I'm not going to, it's not as addictive um, because I might make something that would be, again, like zero, zero sugar and zero sugar sweeteners. Yeah, that's great. Well, if tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you and how they could become a functional medicine coach if they, and how easy it is. Like if someone says, you know what, I really would like to help people in, you know, getting their health back on track. What do they need to do? Yeah. So it's functionalmedicinecoaching.org. And uh, coaching is a field that's exploding. It feels so good. If you have a mission, a calling to help others, and the greatest way that many people heal themselves is to help others. 
Um, and we're on this journey together and coaches work remotely. They can facilitate groups and their world needs you. The world needs people to get together in groups um, and wherever you congregate. Um, so to, to if you find that you're one of those people, like in a, you're in your church group and you're meeting together or a book club and you're talking about your sh- journey with sugar or fasting and people are wanting to know more than you probably would be somebody who would want to become a coach. And uh, we need lots of coaches to, because the world is so many people are suffering from pre-diabetes and diabetes and so many other chronic conditions. Awesome. Well, this is always a pleasure to be with you. Thanks so much for being with us. And remember, if you have a question that you want to answer, go to questions at ChantalRayway.com. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. This has been a Soprato Media Production.